All right, so last week we began talking about the English Civil War and all this historical, political, um, and, and religious context. And, and that's really essential. All of that stuff that we started to talk about um, last week and the, and the stuff that we were going to talk about this week historically um, is essential to understanding um, Paradise Lost. Last week, we discussed the disastrous reigns of the Stuart kings, uh, James I um, and, and his son, and the rising tensions between the crown and parliament uh, because of their belief in absolute rule, divine right. Um, but, but it's under uh, James's successor, Charles I, that tensions finally exploded into violence. Um, we, we know that Charles continued to curb the growing power of Parliament um, in, in his dissolution of it. Um, it. The lingering debts of James I resulted in Charles um, levying new taxes on the citizenry, um, further alienating the population and his sympathetic views toward Catholics um, ignite further resentments in the Puritan-dominated Parliament. Um, last we talked, war had broken out between Parliament and Charles's supporters, the Roundheads and Cavaliers, and the English Civil War really rages um, for nearly a decade. There's kind of three stages of this civil war, um, and under the guidance of Puritan leader Oliver Cromwell, the Roundheads are victorious. And last we had left off, King Charles had been arrested. Well, at the end of the third kind of section of the English Civil War, behind here where you see here, this is a, a the uh, arrest warrant for um, King Charles II. It's kind of cool. Um, he had been arrested. But after um, the ending of the Civil War, when the Puritans have have uh, been successful, the Parliament of uh, the Parliament, um, I lost my okay. Oh yes, um, the imprisoned Charles the First is brought to trial for treason um, or unlawful taxation of the people found guilty and sentenced to execution. Um, this act of regicide was really, I mean, they, they cut his head off um, in the, I mean, it's a big deal. Um, this act of regicide is or was unprecedented. And for many, as we'll see um, with our, our Catherine Phillips poem, it, it's really unthinkable because um, it, it, it helps foster these feelings of fear and instability among the people. And uh, mainly it, it's, it's frightening because no king had ever faced a public trial or a public death. I mean, sure, kings had died in battle or been assassinated or privately been put to death, but this public beheading was really revolutionary and it was a message from parliament to everyone i mean to every I mean, if you can kill the king who's who's safe right um that no man not even a king is above the law um and, and he is he is executed um at the beginning of 1649 and um the reaction of to the people in England it depends on and on on who you were but um it, like i said it was a time of of certain uh uncertainty and certainly um fear because now what happens right um and in the reaction of europe is is that it was largely looked down upon and frowned upon so it really kind of strained tensions between um england and the rest of the continent um while after uh, the execution of Charles I, uh, there is the dissolution of the monarchy altogether and the establishment of the Commonwealth, uh, which in nominally would be a republic. And this republic was governed by um, 
a man named Oliver Cromwell, who I said was the kind of leader of the Roundhead Army. And while nominally a representative of the Republic, um, Cromwell seized total control of the government in 1653, declaring himself Lord Protector for life and ruled England as this military dictator. So essentially what has happened is um, the English people have traded one tyrannical leader for another. Under Cromwell's tenure um, as ruler of the Commonwealth, English society was really turned on its head. Um, he was a devout Puritan, and because of his religious beliefs, Cromwell and his followers were fervently opposed to practices that were considered Catholic um, or immoral, and they rewrite English laws to enforce their morality on others. Um, so while he is... Uh, in power. Um, he closes theaters. Um, pubs or public houses and inns were closed. Public drunkenness was outlawed. He banned sports. Um, swearing could lead to imprisonment. And it, he even goes so far as to um, cancel or ben, he doesn't cancel Christmas. He's not. He, he essentially becomes the Grinch. The government goes so far as to ban Christmas celebrations, um, imposing fines and imprisonment on those citizens caught um, celebrating or putting up decorations. Um, there is also this uh, freedom of speech ends under um, the new laws of censorship, and dissenters were forced into exile. Um, additionally, and, and this is kind of one of the, the straws that, that breaks the camel's back, so to speak, um, Cromwell leads a genocidal conquest into Ireland. He um, wants to get rid of all of those Catholics, and he's afraid that they're going to rise up and usurp his power because so many people who were um, kind of dissenters and royalists went to Ireland um, to kind of flee. Um, anyways, he goes into Ireland and kills almost half its population and seizes property and wealth from Catholic landowners. And this act really plunges Irish citizens into abject poverty. And, and that abject poverty lasts until about the late 19th century. Um, during this time, England's cultural progress and development, uh, the, the progress that really flourished in the age of Elizabeth and even under um, Charles, uh, James and Charles, um, it essentially comes to a halt. Nothing but religious pamphlets and, and kind of political propaganda is being published and everybody kind of, uh, uh, there's this, uh, this stagnation um, really. And um, this kind of disillusionment and stagnation um, really leads to the end of the Commonwealth. Um, and, and part of that um, is Cromwell, I mean, he becomes increasingly unpopular um, and he dies in 1658 and his son Richard takes over. He actually died of a urinary tract infection. Um, uh, surprisingly enough. Anyways, um, his son Richard proves to be an ineffective leader. He, he doesn't really have the respect or the credibility with the army and he's really unable to deal with those financial problems um, that uh, essentially he can't uh, maintain the same control that his father did over the people. Um, so, uh, I lost my place. Um, the growing descent of the English people and Richard's inability to main, con maintain control. Um, ultimately, the Commonwealth collapses in 1660 when Parliament asks Charles II, who had gone into um, hiding in France, um, who we'll talk about next week, Charles the uh, first son to return to England um, and restore the monarchy under the... Um, under the uh, stipulation that it would be a limited or constitutional monarchy. So um, the, the Stuart dynasty is restored in 1660, and um, believe it or not, Cromwell's body is then dug up, and he is beheaded, and his head is put on a, a stake outside of the Tower of London as a warning um, to all traitors. So there are some, uh, he gets a bad rap in, in a lot of ways um, for being this, you know, treasonous, 
um, kind of villain, but in a lot of people's eyes, um, he was very much a hero. And we will talk about one of those said people um, momentarily uh, because it was in this era and uh, this era alone that John Milton lived and wrote um, his epic poem, Paradise Lost. So um, I'm going to stop here and I am going to pick up with um, our discussion on the kind of context and background of Paradise Lost.